but the idea of this is to kind of start out basics and then get into a little bit of the more advanced LV and RV function. And so the calculation packages and things like that, and just getting used to using the calculation packages, which I think is the hardest thing is just figuring out where the buttons are on the machine to okay. give you the answers you want. So we'll do that. And then we'll, the next week we'll go into valves and valvular, evaluating valvular pathology. And then the third week we'll kind of loop back around and go into kind of even more extreme LV functionality in terms of wall motion abnormalities and looking how the machine can do um, strain analysis and all that stuff. Awesome. So that's kind of the function of this. This is pretty far into the twilight zone of advanced echo. I would say a lot of this is not stuff you'll ever use in the ED. But the reason, to me, the reason for this is it's helpful to know kind of what you can do with echo and understand what the potential applications are. So that's my plan. I don't know if there's other burning things that you guys really want to know about cardiac ultrasound or anything like that. No. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I mean, and we'll t I'll kind of go into a little bit of the pediatric applications versus yeah. the adult applications because they're not they're totally different. Mm -hmm. I can't, I have to say that I'm not super comfortable when you get into kind of congenital stuff and like so I'm just kind of sticking with acquired abnormalities and not going into too much into the congenital cardiac abnormalities. Um. We're not probably going to do, Matt and I talked about how much do we do fluid and fluid assessment stuff. So I'm going to talk about it from the cardiac standpoint, but we're not going to probably go into all of the f fluid responsive evaluations in this format. But eventually we'll have to do another kind of series on carotid flow times and portal vein pulsatility and uh, renal artery resistive indices and all those things that are being looked at. And the re I mean, my thought was I, don't, I want to kind of focus in on the heart for this and then Kind of that's a whole separate topic in terms of kind of looking at peripheral, peripheral kind of peripheral perfusion and what you can do with ultrasound. Yes. So really interesting. Yeah. And yeah, and then Matt said I want that in there. I was like, it's not exactly advanced cardiac. It's kind of advanced right. fluid responsive. So the heart fits into that. So, but we will plan to get kind of a lecture into that stuff. Um, so sound good. All right, so basically my goal is, again, I want to do a little bit on how you, my philosophy on teaching basic echo to other people. I think, and, and Debbie can speak to this a little bit, but I think one of the things that you realize as you start doing this is that once you have once you've have the skills, trying to teach other learners, especially cardiac, is challenging. And so I want to spend a little bit of time thinking about, okay, well, how do I actually kind of approach this as teaching the basics to other people. So I know you guys have done the basic stuff before, but I kind of give you a little bit of my philosophy on that. Um, and then to me, this is the next, you know, this stuff is the next step in that. Um, and then the knob, just pushing the buttons on this, so practicing a little bit with the, with the affinity of pushing the buttons to figure out how that gets that, give that output. And so I talked about this a little bit. So we're gonna do RV and LV today, a little bit of valves, a lot of valves next week, and then the LV in more depth. So I know Ted's giving you a couple lectures, right? Um, and Ted and I have somewhat of a different philosophy when it comes to ultrasound. Like Ted loves to zoom in and go into ultra, ultra depth and get very specific about things. My, my general thought is I want people to get a big picture sense first. And so I think sometimes when Ted teaches, you kind of get into these weeds, which are really interesting, but can sometimes can mean that you're, it's hard to get the big picture concept. So that's kind of where we differ a little bit. And some of the things that Ted gets really interested in in terms of cardiac stuff, I don't find as helpful clinically, although they are intellectually interesting. So, um, so when I'm teaching ultrasound, you know, to new learners, really, again, I'm focused on getting them comfortable with the four views and having them understand what is it about each view that's valuable. So I think when you're approaching this as, I'm now gonna teach this to someone else, you want them to understand, okay, well, why do I need a sub a parasternal long, a parasternal short, and an apical fork? And really what I focus on when I'm doing this is, really there's three main things that you're looking for, is, which is, do they have an effusion, yes or not, what's the LV function, and what are their relative chamber sizes? And so that's 
I use that as my teaching tool of, okay, this is why, you know, when you're asking, doing cardiac echo and you're doing a point of care, these are the three questions you're asking. And then you're using the, the, your four views to get to those three questions. So I don't know if that's something that people have, you've heard that before or not. That, yeah. Not put that way. But. Okay. Yeah, to me, like that yeah. is like giving people those tools. So to me, right. So again, sub xiphoid is really just about, is there a fusion or not? And that's really the main goal of when I'm teaching that to other people, why do they need the sub view? view? Okay, well, that's really just, is there an effusion or not? And then, then you get into function, and that's where the peristernal long and the peristernal short come in, and looking at LV function. And so to me, it's I see effusion is that really that's why you get sub -zyphoid. And then your peristernal long, peristernal short are all about looking at the function of the LV. Now, as we'll talk about in the third lecture series, being able to, especially in the short axis, evaluate the different walls can help you with wall motion abnormality and things like that. And it will also, you know, the peristernal long axis will help you a lot with valvular abnormality. So these views can help you with a lot of other things, but I'm introducing it to novices. I try to kind of stick to, okay, really, this is LV function. Um, and then apical four is really relative chamber size. So I find that helpful if you kind of present not non-specific cases. So these are the types of cases I tend to you give when I'm presenting to other people is just kind of these non-specific patients that present with chest pain and shortness of breath. They have, you know, they look pretty sick and then have a fairly nondescript large enlarged heart. Right? So what is, you know, if you're asking, okay, well, what causes someone to have an enlarged cardiac silhouette on chest x-ray and have chest pain and shortness of breath, there's this huge differential diagnosis for what that could be. And then using, saying, okay, well, this is how you would use ultrasound to, you know, find a fusion. So that's, again, kind of reinforcing that idea of, okay, the reason you're doing this is you have nonspecific presentation, you have a non-diagnostic chest x-ray, you can do a fusion. And then you give them, you know, the next level of this, which is, okay, you have the same, basically, same patient, right? But now, and the same x-ray, but then you go into, okay, now we use, now we've done a fusion, now we do go function. Um, and I usually try to kind of have, especially if people are new at learning this, is have some type of normal reference and abnormal at the same time so that you can say, okay, well, that's normal up on the left in terms of LV function. And then that's clearly, you know, then to that, to them, that's clearly kind of abnormal. I mean, in this case, right, so this is, you know, not only do you get the function, but then you also get this, here's, here's this complex pleural fusion here. Right, so there's the descending thoracic aorta, and that's LV. There's no pericardial effusion in this case, but you can say, okay, now this is the pleural effusion that's tracking back behind the descending thoracic aorta. And and then and then to me also peristernal short is really where, especially when I'm trying to figure out how bad is the function, peristernal short is really my go-to view to decide, okay. I'm worried about function. It looks it looks bad on my sub xiphoid. It looks bad on my peristernal long axis, but my peristernal short axis is always my double check. So as long as I'm seeing what you know this really poor function on a peristernal short axis, and really trying to be at the level of the of the papillary muscles, and if I see really poor function on a peristernal short, that's my double check always on. Okay, this is definitely decreased function. The trick is when you get super bradycardic patients that sometimes that you can underestimate ejection fraction if they're bradycardic. It just looks slow and so your eye says, oh, that's a decreased EF. And in, in peristernal long and in sub xiphoid you can do that. What I find is if, you're, if you have your peristernal short, you're a little more honest with yourself because to me just that looking at how much of this black space actually disappears in each contraction is a little easier to estimate in a peristernal short view. So that's really where I use the peristernal choice to just kind of double track break. So, I mean, and when you give people comparisons, that compared to this, it's pretty straightforward that the ejection fraction of this patient is pretty good compared to that, that terrible ejection fraction. And then, and then the last, the, for me, the apical four chamber is really just about relative, cha relative chamber size. And I say RV and LV, which is primarily what we think about is, is the RV bigger than the LV, but also the atria. So if the if an, a single atria is dilated, that's usually a sign of a, a valvular pathology, right? So if you have the 
LV that's massively dilated, but the rest of the chambers look fine, that's almost always a mitral valve problem. And if you have an RV that's massively dilated, but the right ventricle looks fine, that's almost always a tricuspid, you know, a tricuspid valve problem. You know, if the if the RV and the RA are dilated, then you're starting to think about something in the pulmonary tree. So to me, having those all four relative chambers helps me kind of figure out where is that pathology most likely to be. So again, so that's kind of, that's my approach to the effusion function relative chamber size. So then again, there's another kind of just generic case, generic x-ray, and you can say, okay, well now, what's the relative chamber abnormality in this, you know, here's our parasternal shorten. And people can pick up pretty quickly that if this is normal and that's the LV, that this RV is massively, massively dilated. You also get a sense here that that, right atrium is probably massively dilated. And so this is the apical four chamber view on that patient. So, re so you effusion function relative chamber says, well, what, does, what do these two relative chambers tell you about the most likely pathology in this patient? That, that there's a obstructive process in, the, in between the yeah. left and right. Yeah. So that's severe pulmonary hypertension. Right. Or, yeah. And so, and especially in the ICU setting, is this a PE or is this chronic yeah. pulmonary hypertension? And I would, I mean, to me, the reason you know this is chronic is because you look at the, yeah, I mean, look at how, how thick the RV is. And in the RV wall looks almost as thick as the LV wall and the RA is, is massively dilated. So that takes time. So they could have chronic PEs, but this is not the case. This is not what an acute PE looks like. So you can kind of use the relative chamber size, not just for RV, LV, is the RV big or not, but you can use that as a, does the, if the, if both the RV and the RA are dilated, but the left side looks fine, that's almost always a chronic pulmonary, you know, something in the pulmonary tree, right? So that's how I, I found these, just even the basics helpful in kind of sorting through processes and helping students kind of think about, well, there's, there is a way that you can use this beyond just kind of is the LV good or bad? Is there a fusion or not? Um, and then sometimes it's right. It's sometimes obvious, right? Uh, but this is a good example of, you know, to me, this is a good example of big, you know, the, R, the RV gets big and it pushes the LV out of the way. This RA isn't actually that dilated at this point. Um, you can't really tell, but this is, yeah. So this is, a, but the RV is dilated because of the acute rest, the other half of this clot that's in his, pulmonary tree somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I'll give you, this This will be the last case of kind of basic stuff. So then you have, you can have branches of that where you can kind of loop back into some of the more complex stuff. So if you have 64 year old man, female presents from dialysis, comes in hypotensive, short of breath, and then has this x-ray, you're starting to think about fluid, you know, all the typical stuff. But then if I show you this ultrasound, so, and the, I usually end with something like a case kind of like this for, so then you go through your same algorithm, a fusion, you know, cause she's from dialysis, she, she could have, so she doesn't have a big effusion. LV function, yeah, it looks okay, right? So then, so now, okay, so LV function, so we, a fusion function, that, those both look pretty good. Relative chamber size. Yeah, so the left atrium looks big, right? So if that's the case, if the left atrium's big, but the LV is functioning fine and the right side looks fine, the pathology is most likely at the maltreal valve. And you actually, if you look at her mitral valve, right, she has a flail segment. So can you see right here? So you see how those two segments aren't actually co-apting? Uh, yeah. So can you see... So, well, those two, actually, the leaflets are missing each other. So yeah. she has a flail like segment. Yeah, so this is the, you know, here's the, here's the, you know, septal portion. And you can see that that is actually not, those are connecting. So if you put color flow on this, yeah. you know, she's got this huge regurgitation jet. And then just her valves aren't lining up at all. Um. So that goes into kind of the next level of, okay, now I, like, I need to know more about valves. 
but the basics can give you some sense of what you know when to start investigating those valves and, and how to look at that. So that's my just basic 30 second, well, I guess 10 minute quick <laughs> overview of how kind of I try to walk people through that process and realize that even the basics can give you a ton of information beyond just what's the ejection fraction and what's the function like. But, um, but you can get into a lot more of the advanced imaging, especially when it comes to LV function. Now, I will give the caveat that I, I don't think quantifying LV function is very helpful for the most part for what we do. Um, even I think, I mean, I don't know, even in the ICU, I'm not sure knowing that the ejection fraction went from 40% to 50% is, is all that helpful a lot of the time. Because really, you're using more of the clinical aspects of okay, did if I added, you know, if I gave them dobutamine, does it did, did their perfusion improve? You don't really care that much if their ejection fraction went from forty to fifty percent. I do think it's helpful to realize wh how these things are done, just because from a standpoint of as you start to practice, knowing why the cardiologist got an EF of fifty percent and you said the their EF was thirty percent, and understanding kind of how they're doing those calculations, I think can be helpful. So we'll talk a little bit about how, the, how you quant quantify systolic function, talk a little bit about diastolic function, which I think is even more useful from an ED and an ICU standpoint, and then how to measure cardiac output, and briefly a little bit on RV function. So I will send this PowerPoint to you guys, but this is kind of my PowerPoint. This, this is a 80 slide, I think, or something, PowerPoint that I found online, and each slide is literally encapsulates one cardiac measurement um, kind of function. So it has like in one slide, so you aren't gonna figure, remember all of it, but it's my, it's usually what I go to when I'm like, I can't remember how to do this cardiac calculation. I'll go to this PowerPoint slide and look up mitral valve mm -hmm. area, and then it'll give me in one slide a quick kind of re recap of that. Awesome. <clears throat> so I'll send you guys that, that slide, but I find this really helpful. So this is the one for the Simpsons method of discs. So Simpson's method of disc is probably the most common way that that cardiologists will do measure ejection fraction of the LV, which is essentially just tracing out the LV in diastole and then in systole and just looking at the change in volume from diastole to systole. And then just that's how the machine then measures ejection fraction. Essentially what it does is it, you know, each of those little and we'll do that, we'll do this on the machine, but each of these little lines is kind of the machine assumes that this is a, a a disc, and then so it has you know small small diameter discs, and then bigger and bigger and bigger, and then smaller again. And you basically measure from the septal portion of the mitral valve straight across to the free wall, and then trace this up really right at the at the endocardial border, all the way up to the apex, and then all the way down again. And then it estimates this whole. And you're supposed to include the papillary muscles, so you're not to kind of supposed to trace around the papillary muscles. Mm -hmm. So you basically just do you you kind of trace that that all the way around, and then you do the same thing in diastole, and it just estimates each disc volume. You know, so it basically takes two dimensions and it estimates what a three dimensional disc would be in that, and then it just gives you an area, and then it looks at the change in the area. So you don't have to do any of that stuff. It's just really just trace the the LV in systole and trace the LV in diastole. And then it will spit out an ejection fraction for you from that. Now, when you do this, do you have to measure it in, do you have to do that in both apical four and apical two shape? You don't have to. Okay. It's the more, the, the more views, you know, you're always trying to kind of do a three dimensional right. estimation of a two dimensional image. And so the more, the more views you can get, the more accurate your estimates are. But you so, still get a number. So you can still, yeah, yeah, you can still do a number. And most, I would say for the most part, when we've, when I've done this, um, that I've mostly just been doing it as an apical four and getting one number from there. So the reason, I mean, they're, they're actually the reason I started getting interested in this is we were doing in Tanzania, we were doing, we were trying to kind of look at patients, HIV positive patients pre and kind of pre-ART, so pre-treatment, and then after they're on treatment and looking at cardiac function, because there's a lot of literature in high resource settings about just HIV itself and treatment causing cardiovascular dysfunction. And so we they wanted, we wanted to look at what's the cardiovascular dysfunction burden in, in low resource countries. And so we kind of cobbled together this 
advanced but still point of care echo protocol that would allow us to get a lot of of information without doing a full you know you know echo that the echo text would do and so we kind of broke it down into like what are the things that are really measurements that can be done relatively easy for someone who's knows their echo but isn't so advanced that you need the 40 you know $400,000 machine to do so that's part of it. So this is a this is one of the images from that study. So here you can see we did basically we just traced out the LV, and again you can see why sometimes it's a problem, right? So in this case the LV isn't always on the screen, and so there's kind of like the uh, estimated, and then and then there's then here systole, and basically what the machine does is give you an EF, and it, it's essentially what it's doing is measuring the volume, the approximated volume. So that's what this looks. It looks a little different on that machine, but it's basically the same thing. The other way that this is is sometimes done is this idea of e point septal separation. You have you heard? Yeah, both of you. Is, right. So this idea, right? So basically, you just look at how close the mitral valve leaflet gets to the septum, and you measure the distance between the mitral valve and end mode and the septum. And then, if it's essentially if it's less than eight millimeters, that's normal, and if it's greater than eight, that's abnormal. So, do you usually take the time to actually measure it? I, 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 I would say I've never found this to be helpful okay. <laughs> in terms of, you know, in terms of calculating. The only reason I include it is you will hear people say EPSS right. and people will act like you should know what it is. And I think it's helpful just to have seen what is it actually. But the clinical utility in my mind is, is very little in this case. Um, the idea that the mitral valve, you know, in a normal functioning LV, the mitral valve should pretty much hit the septum is I think a useful just double check on yourself. So I do definitely teach that to the residents, things like that. But this is when you, if you actually look at what is the EPSS, that's there's actually, and there's actually a number, I didn't put it, the formula in there, but there's, you can actually estimate an injection fraction based on the exact EPSS that you measure. Um, and then, so obviously that's super abnormal EPSS. The, so the big problem and the reason EPSS isn't super helpful is that there are a lot of reasons why you might have a normal LV function, but you might ha not have a normal EPSS. So this is, this is a patient we had who's got obviously pretty bad aortic regurgitation. And I just, I love this image mostly. It's just an excuse to like, so here you can see her aortic regurg and you can see that the jet is perfectly timed to hit the mitral valve leaflet as it's trying to open, right? Huh. And so even if, I mean, her, this ejection fraction is down a little bit, but you can see that that aortic regurg is actually blowing that mitral valve leaflet down so that you, no matter what, you're not gonna have a very good EPSS. That's really cool. Yeah. And so any valvular, any aortic valve pathology or mitral valve pathology is gonna give you an abnormal number, even though it's not, it doesn't have anything to do with the LV. So. Um, questions about that so far? Pretty, pretty straightforward. So those are like the two, I would say the co most common, there's lots of other ways, but I would say from what I've run across in terms of ED ICU terminology, Simpsons and EPSS are the two most commonly referred to ways to measure ejection me given quantified number for ejection fractions. Simpsons by far, I think is a more robust way to do that if you have to do it. Now, in pediatrics, you get the shortening fraction, right? <laughs> um, do you, you got, right? Isn't that still, aren't they doing shortening? Isn't that all the echo reports? Or do they put an ejection fraction? Do you know, Debbie? Yeah. On the pediatric echoes? Are <laughs> 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 you never seen shortening fraction? No. Okay. So this I mean, will actually show up in some of the adult. Really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It was when I was it's, when I was a resident yeah. here. All of the pediatric echoes would say shortening fraction. So I don't know if they've changed. Maybe they've changed now. But I know this does happen in. Um, and it's not, shortening fraction I always thought was just kind of a, another way of saying it. it's not the ejection fraction. So the shortening fraction is essentially normal is 25 to 45%. It's usually about half the ejection fraction. So when they're doing shortening fraction, 
they're looking at just the fraction of the LV in systole and diastole, usually in parasternal long axis, that shortens. And so the way, and I was trying to do this on the machine, but basically the way you do that is you measure the LV diameter in a parasternal long axis in diastole. So here's here I'm measuring, we're measuring the whole thing, but essentially we're measuring RV diameter and then we're measuring septal diameter. Here, now we're measuring LV diameter and then we're measuring free wall diameter there. So essentially you just drop calipers across all of these different areas and you can see here that we get numbers for each of those. Um, and they're at, in the third lecture, we'll talk about LV mass and how that comes into play, right? Because you can have, there are reasons why you might want to know how, what the actual mass of the LV is, especially when you talk about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or something like that. So you actually can estimate LV mass from this as well. But for the, the idea of shortening fractions is essentially what it's doing is then you do this in, in systole as well, and you're just comparing this diameter. So the diameter in diastole versus the diameter in systole, and that's giving you a shortening fraction. And here you can see this is this is essentially, and then it's taking that shortening fraction number and then me measuring an injection fraction. So it's estimating an injection fraction from that sh from that shortening fraction. So you can get, and then you can actually get um, you can actually get some other numbers from that as well. But that's what a, if you if you ever look at a pediatric echo and they're giving you shortening fraction, that's basically what they're doing. You can also do it in a parasternal short axis view and with M mode. So sometimes they'll do it this way where they'll essentially measure, you know, what they'll do is they'll measure that here, they're, they'll measure that, they'll measure the wall, but they'll also measure this diameter. And then, so there's the end, I think this is end diastolic. So this is end diastolic volume here. And then they'll do an end, a end, uh, or end, yeah, end diastolic and end systolic. And then, so here you can see they're kind of measuring that, just the difference between this one and this one. So this is, again, this is in short or in long axis, but it's essentially the same idea. So you're measuring this LV diameter in diastole, LV diameter in systole, and then it's giving you the shortening. That's where the, and then it's spitting out, in this case, a shortening fraction. It's also spitting out an ejection, and that's the ejection fraction, and that's the shortening fraction. So if you ever hear shortening fraction, just so you know what that is and how they're coming up with that number. It works pretty well in pediatrics in the sense that the LV is usually, if it's going to, for the most part, if you think about pediatric cardiovascular pathology, usually it's not that you infarct one wall of the LV and you take out the septum. So usually if it's going to be dysfunctional, it's going to be globally dysfunctional. The problem with the shortening fraction in adults is if, if you have a big MI and you take out the septum, their EF might be normal but their shortening fraction might be terrible, right? right? Just because their septal wall is not moving. And so that's, I think, I, I mean, I, I think that's why that happens. In the end, no matter what those measurements you do, it, the machines will always do the calculations for you and then they will give you, they all look a little bit different, but they'll, they'll spit out this information here. And so they'll give you an EF and they'll give you a stroke volume. And they'll oftentimes, if you're doing pediatrics, they'll give you a shortening fraction as well. So, Really, it's just a matter of knowing how to push the buttons and get the get the <laughs> measurements done. And once you've done that, then the machine will do all the calculations. All right. So that's ejection fraction. So we'll move on to then cardiac output. And I think this is where volume assessments, kind of assessing volume responsiveness comes in a little bit more. We'll talk a little bit about why this is more challenging than it um, just in a sick patient. But basically, right, when you're talking about Cardiac output, you really just want stroke volume times heart rate. And so the way you calculate stroke volume is just essentially knowing the diameter of the aortic outflow tract and knowing the volume of blood that goes through that aortic outflow tract per heartbeat. And so really all you have to do for that is measure the LVOT, so the left ventricular outflow tract diameter. So you measure here, really right below, so there's the aortic valve, and you're going to you re measure right below the aortic valve there. And then you what you're then the next thing is looking at the volume of blood going through the LVOT. And really that's just a matter of putting Doppler over the LVOT and then looking at that Doppler flow. Okay, so each pulse is a Doppler flow. And this is really hard to conceptualize by looking at pictures. It's really easy to see when you're on the machine. So I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about exactly how to get these. 
But essentially what you want to do is look at what's the diameter of the LVOT and then what's the amount of flow that's going there. And if you trace out the flow over the LVOT and you multiply it by the diameter and then, then you have a stroke volume, right? Cause that's just one beat. And then you, once you have a heart rate, your heart rate times stroke volume is the area to your cardiac, cardiac output. So let's see here. That, I mean. So then, so, so peristernal long axis, and you're really measuring the LVOT right, again, right below the mitral valve. So right here is where you're gonna measure the LVOT. So that's, this is another example of where we're measuring LVOT diameter. The, the tricky thing is kind of getting a good peristernal long axis view. The double check for is the LVOT should, in adults should always be between 1.8 and 2.2. So if you ever get a number that's well outside, you know, approximately two, you probably done something wrong. So that's LVOT, peristernal long. And then the, the way you get the <clears throat> VTI is just going into an apical four, rotating just slightly into an apical five, and then getting looking at flow right here out of the LVOT going out of the aortic valve there. And so that's what this looks like. So this is a apical five chamber view. It's a pulse wave Doppler right over that LV. OT and what you get is each pulse it, you you get each pulse here and that's your vol that's your absolute velocity but essentially the volume of blood is the area under that curve and so the machine will let you trace out the area under that curve and then it will give you actually the volume here so here's here's our there's our velocity max is 109.9 centimeters per second um, and you can see that, uh, and then that's giving us a, I think that's our volume there. Um, and then so you can basically just highlight that area and the machine will do the calculations of the LVOT and the, and the VTI. There's actually the, one of the GE, the GE machine. So there's a couple of GE machines that will actually do this automatically for you. So you basically tell it what you want and then it will put the Doppler on there and then it will do the, it will kind of do that cardiac output calculation. It will find the optimal LVOT tracing and then it'll do the tracing for you. So this is the next generation of, of doing that, which is probably gonna work at, like the AI is gonna start working its way into the machines where some of these things are, can be done. If you have a good view, it can do all the, all the rest of the stuff automatically. Um, which I think is helpful because once they become more point of care, then it's helpful to know actually how did these get done? Because right. the, you can imagine there's a lot of mistakes that can get made in, when you're measuring diameters in terms of getting calculations, right? So if you are, if you're off on the side on, on your, in your looking at your outflow, you can drastically under or overestimate the volume of blood and so that you can therefore kind of end up with a cardiac output that's way, way different than what it actually is. So to get that <clears throat> on these machines, you have to get that peristernal long, measure the LV, yeah. flow track, yeah. switch to an apical four, apical chain, four yeah. and, then and then go from apical four, rotate slightly into an apical, apical five, five, and then get the LVOT. Okay. Um, all of the machines, the Spark will do all of these calculations as well. Now the question, and <laughs> The problem with that is that a lot of the more advanced calculations also require that you've purchased the cardiac package. Mm, that's all they so, make their money. Yeah. So the ED machine, the ED Sparks, I'm pretty sure have the cardiac package. Are the Sparks here in the ultrasound center don't have any of the cardiac stuff? I'm not sure about the ICU one. Um, and that'll get as we talk about diastolic dysfunction, we'll talk about why that's you know why you need some of those calculations as well. All right, so have I lost you guys? So far, so good? So we, ejection fraction, cardiac output. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, so the last part is diastolic dysfunction, right? Because the, the whole issue is the heart contracts and then the, I would say, the, one of the things that people have started to, in, at least in the point of care echo world, to say, oh yeah, the heart actually has to relax as well. And there, there are times where patients have normal ejection fractions, but they may have diastolic dysfunction, so they can't relax. So knowing how to kind of basically estimate diastolic dysfunction can be pretty helpful as well. Now, the caveat to diastolic dysfunction is 
if there is systolic dysfunction for any reason, there is by definition diastolic dysfunction. So if their EF is 10%, you don't have to do diastolic function because by definition, if, they're, if they have poor systolic function, they have poor diastolic dysfunction. Also, if they have bad LVH or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or anything where they have obvious abnormalities of the muscles themselves, they're going to have diastolic dysfunction. So this is really for those patients. And I think the more I've done this, the more I see them, which is they present, they look and smell and act like CHF. You're volume resuscitating them, either in the ED or the ICU, but you throw the probe on and their EF looks fine to you. Like yeah. their EF looks fine. They can tolerate more fluid. But what, but then two liters later, they're drowning, right? And that's because, and oftentimes it's not in their, I mean, oftentimes it's their lungs aren't too bad. It's their, they just swell up everywhere else. Right. And I think, I mean, the, my understanding is a lot of that sometimes is their diastolic, they have, they have diastolic dysfunction, they're fluid overloaded. You've basically, you're, they, they cannot just, they, they can't relax enough to right. push that fluid through. And so kind of being able to grade diastolic dysfunction is helpful in that case. And really when you're grading diastolic dysfunction, what you're just looking at how well can the LV relax. So the first step in doing that is looking at inflow through the mitral valve. So as the LV relaxes, it sucks blood up through the mitral valve. So you can look at mitral valve inflow. And that's like putting now the same, that same pulse wave Doppler, not over the outflow track, but looking at the mitral valve inflow. And then normal mitral valve inflow is the E wave and A wave that we got tortured with in medical school, right? But I was like, I don't know, <laughs> this is never gonna be helpful. And then it's like, oh, wait a minute, this is really important, right? So E is diastolic, early diastolic or early ventricular relaxation, and then the A wave is the atrial kick. So the E wave, the LV relaxation should always be bigger than the A wave. And so that's the first thing you look at is measuring the E wave. So this first one here is E wave. So that's E wave, and that should be always taller than the A wave. So you have E wave, A wave, and you can see it kind of repeats E wave, A wave, E wave, A wave. And the next thing you want to do is look at now not the inflow, but actually look at the velocity of the LV wall. So you can use tissue Doppler to look at now, instead of looking at blood flow velocity, you can actually use tissue Doppler to look at tissue velocity. And so what you, what this allows you to do is look at the velocity of the LV as it contracts and relaxes. And this is called E prime and A prime. So this is it's the same thing where your, your, your LV relaxation should always be greater than your kind of the atrial kick as it stretches the LV a little bit further. So the, you can take the E prime and A prime at the septum or on the free wall as well. Uh, and we'll go through, we'll, we'll, do that on the machine as well. But essentially this, these two numbers are kind of how you get to diastolic dysfunction. So this is the diastolic dysfunction spectrum. So that yeah. last slide, yeah. and this probably is a stupid question, but no, this. Um, so could you, so when you're, if you're looking at tissue velocity, can't you, couldn't you also use M mode? I know that's not done, but theoretically. Um, hmm. I don't know. How would you do? I'm trying to think of. I mean, if like, you're just looking at an M mode cursor across that same, you know, across that yeah. same area, and you see that line move over a, per over a period of time, then that gives you a velocity, right? Yeah, I guess you could. It's just not done that way. I th well, I think. I mean, I don't know for sure, but rem when M mode first came out, you could only do M mode in a. The problem, the problem with. And this will go back to the physics of Doppler, which is the problem with m measuring velocities that are 90 degrees to right. the ultrasound probe always gets you in trouble, right? So the M mode cursor really, if in, until recently, M, when you could angle M mode cursors, M mode cursors really could only give you velocities towards and away from the probe, okay. not side to side. Now, nowadays, you can actually angle your M mode cursor so right. you can get you can get velocities that are left and right as well as up and down. But if you think about the way M mode was always done was yeah. always up and down. So I, my guess would be that the reason that you use tissue Doppler is because you can actually get velocities that are, ha are, are 60 yeah. degrees yeah. relative to the probe. But I don't know for sure. But a good question. All right, so these are the normal and abnormal diastolic dysfunction curves.
the the problem with diastolic dysfunction is it gets super complicated really quickly, which means that your initially your E wave should always be bigger than your A wave. The problem is as you get into more severe diastolic dysfunction. So in initial kind of impaired relaxation, which is the first stage of diastolic dysfunction, your E wave because your LV relaxation gets worse, your E wave gets smaller and your A wave gets bigger, right? So the LV kind of gives up and the atrium pushes more blood, which is great. And you can say that's definitely, so if you see an E wave that's smaller than an A wave, that's always diastolic dysfunction. The problem is as the LV pathology gets worse, it actually reverses back to a pseudo normal pattern where the E wave gets bigger than the A wave again. So the reason, the only reason you need tissue Doppler is because this mitral valve inflow velocity or relative velocities alone can fool you, right? Because how do you know if you're at normal or pseudo normal? Well, the way you know is looking at tissue Doppler because the E wave, the velocity of the actual tissue will always be less. So you can see here your E, e prime, the velocity of the LV will actually always will get smaller and smaller. So that's kind of how you no, is it pseudo normal or is it normal? Um, yes, you can. Yeah, you can look at. I can't remember exactly why you do that though. There's a reason. I think you can. Yeah, you can look at how if like, you can look at reversible versus irreversible diastolic dysfunction. And that is based on Valsalva. But I cannot, for the life of me, remember what the clinical relevance <laughs> of that is. Um, uh, yeah, I'll have to look at that again. So this, these are what kind of the tracings would look like, right? So here's normal, and then you get back to this kind of pseudo-normal pattern, but you can see your tissue Doppler, your E, your e prime is really low compared to kind of a normal E prime there. Uh, I think one way that clinically part of that is, and again, this is where I can't remember exactly what the Valsalva tells you, but one of the things that is probably true is that patients actually ha can move between levels of diastolic dysfunction. And so from an ICU setting standpoint, right? So if you're here, if they're restrictive and you're trying to give them more fluid, it will, it's not going to work, right? It's, they're over, they, basically they're overstretched. And so there's too much volume in there. If you diurese them and they move to pseudo normal, then you actually have information that, okay, if I can move my patient by diuresing them here, that me, that gives me an idea of like, how far do I diurese them, right? And then if you, if you can diurese them more and they get to impaired, re, impaired relaxation, that's actually kind of a powerful tool to be like, okay, I can watch them change, you know, watch the spectrum of their diastolic dysfunction. Now, how important, like, how much that means clinically, I. Again, I don't know if there's enough literature, and I certainly haven't looked recently. But it was just this idea of, you know, is you can if you're overloading someone too much, you can actually push them all the way kind of into restrictive. And if you can diurese them a little bit, you can maybe move them back, and that might tell you a little bit about kind of irreversible versus reversible. I don't know. Has anyone? Do you, are you guys? Does anyone in the ICU? Do they do any? No. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. No. I mean, this is definitely w well within the realm of things I've I've heard critical care folks doing it for point of care ultrasound. Just looking at okay, how like in terms of volume assessment, what's their systolic function, but also what is their dias? You know, if their systolic function looked okay, can I look at how how to manage fluids based on looking at their diastolic function and optimizing diast diastole, right? Because that's a lot of the times the the problem is getting them to relax, not so much contract, right? You can always flog the LV more. I mean, not always, but you can usually flog, get the LV to contract a little bit more. But it's the question of like, how do you optimize relaxation? And sometimes they may, may need more diuresis versus more volume. And if you have a marker that tells you I'm going the right direction, that's pretty powerful. Yes. So. That's very interesting. So again, I need to do some more digging into exactly how people are, are using that in the point of care setting. But that was the kind of idea about kind of measuring diastolic function. Um, I will say that as I've gotten into this a little bit more and talked to some cardiologists, it gets very, if you kind of move beyond the basics, 
it gets really complicated about how you quantify exactly diastolic dysfunction. So I don't want you to remember, like look at or memorize anything on this slide. Just realize that there are lots of different ways to kind of decide whether or not, you know, one marker doesn't actually help. It's a combination of all these different things. So I find this one pretty, this actually pr somewhat helpful in terms of just thinking about, okay, if I was going to start doing a lot of diastole, diastolic dysfunction, what, like, what's the, you know, good way to do that. So, I mean, you can look at kind of these four markers uh, and we'll talk a little bit about how to get some of the other stuff, but really the E to E prime is essentially just the, the, that E wave we got and then the E prime and just measuring the, the um, <clears throat> ratios of those two. So if that's greater than 14 and if that's greater than 14 and the septal E prime velocity or the lateral, right? So that's where you get that, the E prime, if those are less than seven or less than 10, if so, if those are both positive, right? That's someone who likely has diastolic dysfunction. But you can, the, the trick is you can have, both of those can be relatively normal and you can, you can still have diastolic dysfunction. So that's just what this kind of says. And then it gets even, more if you actually get into all this stuff they do all this it gets really complicated so this is by far something that i think is has some superficial help for us but it can get kind of get you can get into the weeds a little bit um <clears throat> one of the other ways that diastole is measured and just so if you ever if you ever hear this is looking at the is looking at the IVRT, so the isovolemic, uh, <clears throat> uh, isovolemic relaxation time, which is essentially just kind of the time between when the aortic valve closes and the mitral valve opens, and so you can you can measure that time as well. And so it, as you know, as IVRT increases, that's increasing diastolic dysfunction. Unfortunately, it's like up to a point, and then at some point it starts decreasing again. So normal is 70 to 90 milliseconds. I don't, I would say clinically, I don't use this at all. It's just something that kind of, I think adds to the kind of the picture of like, how do you kind of go about this whole diastolic dysfunction? The other thing that is used a lot is looking at the volume of the left atrium. So actually measuring like left atrial volume, right? So as diastolic, in someone who has bad diastolic dysfunction, they should all have enlarged left atrium at some point because of that poor relaxation, the atrium works hard and it dilates. So I don't measure left atrial volume, but that is something that gets done. All right, good, questions? All right, so we'll do one, so we'll do RV really quickly. So the LV is the one that gets all the credit. The one thing I think is really helpful clinically in looking at the RV function is TAPSI. So that is the looking at how the tricuspid annulus moves towards and away from the probe. So this is someone with an acute PE. You can see big RV, normal kind of normal size right atrium. If you look at the tricuspid annulus, so look at the tricuspid here and look at this RV free wall, you can see that this actually doesn't move towards the probe very well. So the LV contracts in multiple different directions, right? So it's up and down, it's left, right. But the RV really just goes like, just goes up, down, up, down, up, down. So if you lose if the RV stops contracting towards the probe in your apical four chamber view, that's a sign of kind of poor RV ejection fraction or one way that people do that. So here's normal. So you can see that tricuspid annulus is moving really well towards the, to, towards the probe. So you can measure, and this is really poor, right? So sometimes, and, and unfortunately it's not perfect, but if you think about it in terms of someone who has bad pulmonary hypertension. So their RV is hypertrophied, but it's still pumping. Their TAPSI often will be normal because they're still, it can still contract. It's just thickened mm -hmm. and dilated. So it's, whereas if some you, if you acutely overload the, the right ventricle, it, it basically stuns the RV and it can't contract. So it's not, it's not a perfect, I wouldn't say TAPSI is a perfect tool, but it's just kind of another tool in your toolbox. There's some, there's a couple small studies that basically say if your TAPSI, if you have an acute PE, right, and they're symptomatic acutely, so you've proven they have a PE, and their TAPSI is less than 1.6, or some people say 1.7, that's someone who has a much higher likelihood of decompensating. So the way I use this for, clinically is when I have those patients that have, 
that they look okay. And I'm trying to decide, okay, they have an acute PE. Maybe they could go to the floor, but it's a saddle, right? Although but their RV doesn't look too, it's saddle PE by, by CT, but their RV doesn't look too bad. Their, the troponin is not elevated. If I do a tapsy and their tapsy is normal, then they're probably okay. At least the numbers would suggest their prognosis is, is pretty good. If I do a tapsy and their tapsy is low, that's someone who maybe it needs to go to step down or needs to go to the ICU, even if the rest of their markers don't look too bad. So that's kind of how I use it clinically. So tapsy is really just putting an M mode cursor through that tricuspid and looking, and this is where M mode really works well, is looking at the movement of that tricuspid towards and away from the probe. So here's our tricuspid annulus. And really what you're measuring is between the, the peak and the valley. And some people try to measure the, the thickness of the, you don't want to measure the thickness. This is your tapsy here is between the peak of how, this is where the tricuspid annulus gets closest to the probe. And this is where it's farthest away. And you're really just measuring that distance there. So if this is that patient, so this is that, this, this patient's tapsy, right? So that's their, that was their echo. And this is their tapsy. So you can see their distance is one, whereas 1.6, 1.7 would be low normal. So this person has a terrible tapsy. What is tapsy? Tricuspid and tricuspid annual plane systolic excursion. I'm trying to figure it out. Yeah. It, it usually throws people, you know, it's basically just saying how close does the tricuspid annulus get to, you know, how, how much does the tricuspid annulus move per contraction? So there's another, here's just another image of that idea. If like, here's your taps, here's a normal tap, you know, here's an, here's normal tricuspid movement. And then you're basically just peak and then valley. And then you're just measuring the difference between the peak and the valley. I don't find, I find that it's a little, to start here, you oftentimes will mismeasure. So I try to draw a line through the peak and a line through the valley and then measure between the two lines, um, just so that I'm making sure I get there. Uh, this is just more for fun. Mm -hmm. So that's, we'll talk about this in the, I think, in next the next lecture, which is you actually can start looking at, you know, this is the pulmonary, this is pulmonic valve, this is pulmonary artery bifurcation. Mm -hmm. So you can actually start looking, you know, if you have a big PE, yeah. And you have a low tap, so you can actually look at that bifurcation. You can look for a saddle embolus actually on by ultrasound. How are you looking? You get yeah. So well, uh, so this is actually you start peristernal long or yeah. peristernal short, and you just angle up into the into the right side of the heart, and then you just point up a little bit. You can't get cool. it. And then so that's this is pulmonary arteries, and then this is a patient that we had. That, so here's aortic valve. Here's R V. Here's pulmonic valve. Here. Here's pulmonary arteries, and then you can see that's a clot actually sitting in the